Hi, this Bible study is about how the Holy Spirit saves people. I'm Bake Adafi, and we'll begin in just a moment. John chapter 16, verse 7 says, Nevertheless, this is Jesus talking, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he is come, verse 8, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Well, we're going to start uh, with verse 8. Uh, first of all, this is, uh, this is taking place right in the middle of uh, the last night of Jesus' life. He's about to be offered up as a sacrifice for sinners on the cross. He's about to be betrayed by Judas, who's left the, left the group of 11 disciples, of 12, and now there's 11. He's left them. He's gone, and he's going to betray the Lord Jesus, selling him out for 30 pieces of silver. These are Jesus' last words to his disciples. And uh, uh, some of them are in the upper room. He's washed their feet. They're, they're going to have a, uh, the Last Supper. They're going to have the, the Lord's Supper is going to be instituted. And uh, this is probably, um, uh, beside the Sermon on the Mount, one of the longest sermons in the Bible and one of the most beneficial to us as we understand it. He is offering them comfort. And uh, because he's going away, they're sorrowing. They don't understand what's happening. They're not asking the right questions. All this is in chapter 16, uh, before this time of this particular um, study that we're going to do. And now he's uh, telling them um, the primary comfort that he's going to send to them, and that is the Holy Spirit is going to be sent down from heaven by Jesus when he returns to the Father in heaven. He's going to send him down, and the very first thing that Jesus offers as comfort for them is what the Holy Spirit's going to do in the matter of evangelism. Before he talks about how the Holy Spirit is going to impact believers' lives, he talks about how the Holy Spirit is going to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and make it alive in sinners' minds and hearts. This should be a comfort to us to know that when we give the gospel, we're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit working on our side. There is a partnership between each Christian, whether you stand in a pulpit or you're sitting next to somebody on an airplane or you're talking to a family member. There is a partnership that you have with the Holy Spirit that He's going to operate within the message that you speak to the other person or to the group of people or to the large congregation. He's going to be there present and He's going to take the message of the Lord Jesus and He's going to make it alive to them. Verse 8 says that he will reprove the world. All right, so reproof is conviction. It is what the prosecu prosecuting attorney does when he's trying to get a conviction of somebody who he believes has committed a crime. It is convincing. It is rebuking. It is um, taking the message of the gospel and making it alive to a sinner's heart and mind. So that's what the rebuke or the reproof is. Uh, he will reprove the world. And, and notice that it is the world that he uh, reproves. It's, it's, um, this is directed toward unsaved people. World has a lot of various meanings in the, in the New Testament depending upon its context. And in this context, it's talking about evangelism. And it's talking about what the Holy Spirit's actions are going to be as people get saved. How people are saved through his agency. And he is going to reprove the world of these three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. So uh, here's the comfort. We are laborers together with God. We work with him. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says we labor together with God. We have a partner in the gospel message. We're not alone as we give it. The Holy Spirit attends that message and uh, the word of God. And he he uh, makes it alive in the person's life that you're speaking to. You give the message as accurately and as uh, 
powerfully as you can, and the Holy Spirit takes uh, that message and brings life to that person. We don't change the message, we don't add to it, we don't take away from it, and the Holy Spirit's job is to take that message and convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. First, look at verse 9. The conviction of sin is essential to the gospel message. The knowledge of your sin is absolutely essential for you to be saved. If you don't think you have any sin, if you don't see your sin, if you don't understand your sin, then there's no salvation for you. Jesus came to save sinners from their sin and to God and to take them out of their sin and put them in God's kingdom and to take their unrighteousness and cleanse it and give them His righteousness. So by the knowledge of sin uh, comes salvation. And that happens because uh, we as instruments of giving the gospel use God's law to press home the truth of God's word upon the world's understanding in mind so that they will see their sin. Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. Other Bibles translate that word in a different, in a different way. Uh, a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law is our teacher, it is our instructor. It is the thing that um, motivates us and carries us along. Uh, it used to be that you know, you'd have somebody come get your kid and take them to school. Um, that's the idea. They, the law takes us to school. It takes us uh, and shows us our sin. That's the purpose of the law. Uh, it shows us our faults. It shows us our shortcomings. It shows us our, our unworthiness. It shows us how sick we really are. That's what the law does. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, if you want to approach God by keeping a law or being good or whatever standard that you want to set, it's not going to work. Because nobody keeps the law. Nobody keeps it perfectly. Nobody even approaches to keep it perfectly. And all the law does for us is bring the knowledge of sin into our minds. I mean, that is a mercy from God. That is God's, that's the first inklings of God's grace being imparted to a person as they begin to see themselves as a sinner. And that comes as wise Christians uh, apply the law to their hearts and minds, and the Holy Spirit takes that law and shows them their shortcomings and that they don't believe in Jesus and that they need a Savior. So the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law, by the law is the knowledge of sin. If you're going to work with the Holy Spirit uh, as uh, an ally and a partner, you need to understand this. You need to be expert in applying the law to people's hearts and minds and souls. People need to know their sin before they can be saved because they don't believe in Jesus. Verse 9 is the primary sin. What's wrong with people? They don't believe in Jesus. They have no need for Him. They are perfectly capable of handling their own lives standing before God in their own righteousness, presenting themselves to God and expecting to be accepted. And that is never going to happen. Our self-righteousness is our condemnation. Approaching God by good deeds, approaching God by how we've lived our lives, only leads to disaster. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin because they don't believe in Him. That's the number one sin. If you don't believe in Jesus, you will not be saved. John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Only by the Lord Jesus is there salvation. And outside of the Lord Jesus, there is no salvation. Not believing on Jesus is the primary sin then in verse 10, uh, the whole, the Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will convict the world of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. So, Jesus himself is the standard of righteousness. He is the perfect standard of how to be acceptable to God. Perfection, completeness, holiness, 
Uh, he's the yardstick. He's the gauge. He's the standard. If you want to understand how holy you have to be to be accepted uh, by God, you look at the Lord Jesus, you see his righteousness, and if you can match that, you can make it. Nobody measures up to his righteousness. We are all fall short. We are all undone by our sin. When the world is convicted of Jesus' righteousness, it sees how far short they fall. Jesus ascended back up into heaven. He sent down the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin because they don't believe in Him. Uh, to convict the world of righteousness because He's not there anymore. So what the Holy Spirit does is take the message of the Lord Jesus and spread it throughout any, any place in the world where the gospel is preached. Jesus could be at one place at one time when he was on earth. In that little nation, primarily with that, those few disciples, and his righteousness was seen there. Now he's ascended to heaven, he sent down the Holy Spirit, and his righteousness is, is uh, proclaimed by that Holy Spirit uh, wherever the Gospels preach, wherever the Bible is taken. Listen to his righteousness. John chapter 8, verse 46, Jesus says, Which of you convinces me of sin? Who can say this? I can't say that to anybody. No one can say this. If you look at a person's life, I mean, if you could really uh, throw back the covers and uncover what they're really like, you'd see uh, the rottenness that's really there. J Jesus invited people to do that. Nobody could convince him of sin. They followed him around like the paparazzi do today to uh, movie stars to take their pictures, but they followed Jesus around to find out anything that he'd done, is, done that was wrong. They sent their best attorneys. They sent the best lawyers. These people were expert in their law. They're looking for any, anything that he did that would show him uh, to be a phony and a fraud, and they would, they would proclaim that and say, well, we saw him do this, and, and we have these witnesses against him now. But there was none of that. He could say, which one of you convinces me of sin? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Jesus knew no sin. There was no sin in him. He was perfect without sin. He was God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity come in human form. Um, he, was, he knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the righteousness that he has, um, we get when we put our faith and our trust in Him. We are unrighteous by nature. We are sinners by nature. We, we live in our sin and we love it there. And when God comes into our life and the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and Christ's righteousness, uh, we repent and we turn to Him in faith. And we get His righteousness accounted to us. I mean, who can fathom how marvelous that is? When you stand before God, He's gonna look at you and say, you are perfect. There's nothing that I can find uh, no fault in you, all because we've attached ourselves to the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, Jesus Christ is made unto us righteousness. He is our righteousness. Our standing before God is a righteous standing because we're in the Lord Jesus. Acts 17.31 says, God will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ. He is going to be the righteous standard of judgment. His life, the way he obeyed the law, every jot, every tittle, completely obeyed it. That's the standard of righteousness. If you want to approach God by your works, then measure yourself against the Lord Jesus. Don't measure yourself against what you think you should be or what other people are doing or the society or your culture. Measure yourself against the true standard of the Lord Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does, convicts the world of Jesus' righteousness in order to show us that we are unrighteous and we are undone and we are unholy. Verse 11 says, uh, He convicts the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. This is a little harder to understand. First, who is the prince of this world? Uh, we know it's not Jesus because uh, the Holy Spirit, he's sending the Holy Spirit down to convict the world um, that the prince of this world is judged. It's not Jesus. He's in heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit down um, to convict the world 
of sin and righteousness and to judge the world. Um, it's, um, it's condemnation. It's, it's being found wanting. It's being found defective. Um, the prince of this world is all those things. He's being judged. And um, uh, Satan is the prince of the world. We, we're, we're told this in um, 1 John 3, 8. It says, um, He that commits sin is of the devil. Imagine that. Your sinning is of the devil. He, you're on Satan's side when you sin. You commit yourself to him when you're a sinner. And if you're an unrepentant sinner and you don't have faith in Christ, that's where you live. He that commits sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest or made known or, or become incarnate or shown that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that's what Jesus did when he came into the world. His action upon that cross was the defeat of Satan. He beat him there. He soundly trounced him. The Bible said he crushed his head. <laughs> he destroyed him. On the cross, Jesus saves sinners who confess their sin and see it and see his righteousness. And he defeated Satan completely on the cross. Ephesians 2.2 says, Wherein in times past you walked. So everyone that's born into the world has their, has their manner of life according to the course of the world. According to the, well, it goes on to say, here's how you walked. Walked in the Bible means how you lived. Uh, your conversation, how you behaved yourself. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. Uh, Satan is the prince of the power of the air of this world. Our lives before Christ, before salvation, are uh, along the direction that Satan gives us. We go along with the world. We're part of the world system uh, that he has set up, that Satan has set up. Um, it's against God. It sets itself against God. I mean, you can look at uh, you can look at the United States now in the way that we have uh, disintegrated as a nation. Uh, our morals have come to nothing. We promote the murder of unborn children. And we have families that are disintegrating because uh, we don't know the difference between what a man is and a woman is. And we're told to celebrate when someone uh, d declares themselves to be of the opposite gender that they were born in. That does not fly with God. That's the course of the world. That's the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of this world who sets the course. And that's where we all were before our salvation. Everybody starts out in Satan's kingdom. He's a spirit. He sets the course of the world. And all who are in the world uh, walk according to that course. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them. Satan blinds minds. I mean, that's his business. He's the one that comes and steals the word away from people who don't understand it. Like in the parable of the seed and the sower. I mean, when that word is not understood, it is snatched up by him. He removes it from them. Um, there's life in the seed of the Word of God, and He is against that. The God of this world blinds people's minds uh, that believe not, lest the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ should shine to them. So that's who the prince of this world is in verse 11 of John chapter 16. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The death of Christ was the judgment of Satan. Christ's apparent defeat on that cross flipped everything around. It looked like he was done for. Satan had triumphed. I mean, Satan had, he had his purpose from the very uh, beginning of the incarnation. Revelation chapter 12 talks about this. It talks about uh, Satan standing at the feet of the woman ready to receive uh, the child and kill him when, when he would be born. Um, and, and you see that in Herod's reaction to the wise men coming to, to find out where Jesus would be born. We, we've seen his star. We, we know he's been born. Where, where is it? And uh, 
um, the religious leaders look in the book and they find out that it's going to be in Bethlehem and they send them off to Bethlehem and um, tell them to come back and bring word again. Herod wants to kill this king. Well, what's behind that? That's Satan behind that. And when they don't, re when they return again another way to their own country, Herod sends out his army. And any child that is two years old and younger in that whole region where, where Bethlehem is was killed. He tried to destroy Jesus at his birth. And uh, at his, um, after he was baptized and taken into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days and he was starving to death. I mean, if, at the 40 day point, you're going to die if you don't eat. And that's when Satan came to the Lord Jesus. And one of the things he told him was, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. And he used the word of God incorrectly. You know, he'll, he'll, he won't let you dash your foot against a stone. He'll save you. And Jesus says, you don't tempt uh, the Lord your God. And used, he used the word of God correctly to defeat Satan. Satan wanted to kill him. Throw yourself down. Um, worship me, I'll give you all. I mean, Satan's whole point was to kill the Lord Jesus and to, to get rid of him. And at, at, at his crucifixion, I mean, we're reading it. We're right in the middle of his last night on earth. Um, Judas has already gone out. Judas has been um, inhabited by Satan. Satan has taken over Judas, and Judas is going to betray the Lord Jesus. Satan thinks he's going to win. But in the judgment of God, Satan is going to be defeated. God's going to pour out his wrath on sinners, on the Lord Jesus on the cross, and, and his triumphal resurrection on the third day is the thing that is going to completely defeat Satan. His whole plan comes unraveled. He wanted to destroy the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Here's the gospel message. It's a mystery. People of the world don't understand it unless the Holy Spirit comes along and grants them understanding of their sin, of Christ's righteousness, and of the judgment to come. They aren't going to get it. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. They didn't understand it. Satan didn't understand it. The people that crucified the Lord Jesus, they definitely didn't understand it. But Satan, um, he's been around since the creation. I mean, he was there tempting uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. He didn't understand God. He didn't understand what was happening. He's about to be crushed, and he's participating in it. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, before the foundation of the world to our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have killed him because it was their demise. Satan is undone by the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. His death, his punishment for sin, God pouring out his wrath on him, and his resurrection from the dead is how Satan is undone. Basically, we'd say it like this. He beat himself. And it was all because of God's plan that it should happen that way. John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Jesus is talking about his soon death. Now the prince of this world shall be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. His lifting up from the earth is his crucifixion. Nailed to a cross, set down in the earth, lifted up high, people looking at him and mocking him. There's the judgment of this world. In the death of Christ, Satan is defeated. The prince of the, prince of the world is cast out. He is defeated by what Jesus did. Jesus' crucifixion was the judgment of Satan. Christ was lifted up. Satan was cast out. Revelation 20 says, 2010 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, uh, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever. Cast out forever. <laughs> lake of fire. That's where Satan is going. Judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts of judgment because the prince, I mean, Satan is judged in what happened on that cross and his death and his burial, his resurrection. Satan is defeated. And anyone who is not in Christ, anyone who does not put their faith and trust in Christ is going to be like Satan. 
you're going to be defeated by that cross. That cross is going to be the thing that nails you into hell because you don't believe in Jesus and Jesus is the standard of righteousness and you don't measure up. Christ's crucifixion will be life to you or else it's going to be your death. When Paul preached to King Felix um, in Acts 24, verse 25, Paul, and he re as he reasoned, as Paul reasoned of righteousness, Christ's righteousness, temperance, that is self-control, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you again. Don't let that be you. Don't understand the righteousness of Christ. Don't understand that not believing in Him is, is the unforgivable sin. It's going to take you down to hell. Look at the judgment that's happening. And um, this is the wrong response that Felix has. Put it off. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you hear His voice, how are you hearing? Well, it's because the Holy Spirit is active in your life. The Holy Spirit is showing you Jesus and your sin and His righteousness and the judgment to come. As you hear the words of the gospel preached to you through the Bible, repent and turn to Christ. And the third thing about verse 11 of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Notice that Jesus is the one that's going to do this judging. In John chapter 5, verse 22, it says, The Father judge, judges no man, but He's committed all judgment to the Son. Jesus is going to be the judge, the one that was crucified, buried, and resurrected again. He's going to be the judge, the one that is the standard of righteousness. Faith in Him leads to eternal life. Repentance from sin and trusting in Christ leads to eternal life. Refusing Him leads to judgment, and He's going to be the judge. All judgment is committed to the Son. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone must receive in his, uh, in his body the things done in his body, according what, that, that what she has done, whether it's good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. This should try, strike terror into people who, un, who don't have faith in Christ. You should see the judgment coming. Don't be stupid about this. This is going to happen to everyone. It's going to happen to everyone that's ever lived. You're going to have to stand before Christ. <laughs> Philippians says every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. You're going to be there. You don't want to be on the wrong end of this thing. You're going to, you're going to have the terror of the Lord if you're not on the right side of this. So Paul says, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are manifest unto God, and I trust also are manifest to your consciences. Jesus is seated, seated in heaven. We are standing there. We are being judged by Him. He is the judge of all the earth. I charge you, to, 2 Timothy 4, 1 says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the alive or the quick, and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Second return of Jesus means judgment. There's no escape. No one will escape. The standard is Christ's righteousness. Not believing in him is the number one sin. It leads to hell. It leads to judgment. Romans 2.16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Nothing is going to be hid from him. The things you've got tucked away inside your heart, down deep, and you think nobody knows about it, it's just your secret, that's going to be brought to light. Everything is going to be open and displayed before the Lord Jesus Christ, our judge. He's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. Thanks for watching. I have hundreds of Bible teaching videos on my YouTube channel. Click the red circle icon below called Bible Study Verse by Verse to go there. Then you can click on Playlist and select the videos you'd like to watch. I hope God blesses you as you study His Word.